So, with that, let me take some questions. And I'll start with Darlene Superville of AP. Question, thank you, MR. President. You've been telling world leaders this week that president-elect. Trump is unlikely to govern in the divisive way that he campaigned. But I'm wondering, how can you be so certain of that given that the first group of people he's chosen for? Top national security and law enforcement positions hold the same views that he espoused as a candidate. And second, to follow up on your meeting earlier today with President Putin. Did you discuss with him Russia's alleged meddling in the U? S election? And are you concerned that the kind of involvement that we saw in This year's campaign will be the new normal going forward in future U.S. elections. President Obama, well, what I have said to world leaders is the same thing that I've said in a number of press conferences, which is the president-elect now has. To put together a team and put forward specifics about how he intends to govern. And he hasn't had a full opportunity to do that yet. And so people should take a wait and see approach in how much his policy proposals once in the White House. once he is sworn in, matches up with some of the rhetoric of his campaign. My simple point is, is that you can't assume that the language of campaigning matches up with the specifics of governing. Legislation, Regulations, and Foreign Policy I can't be sure of anything. I think, like everyone else, 
we'll have to wait and see. But as I've said before, once you're in the Oval Office, once you begin interacting with world leaders, Once you see the complexities of the issues, that has a way of shaping your thinking and, in some cases, modifying your thinking, because you recognize this solemn responsibility not only to the American. people but the solemn responsibility that America has as the largest, most powerful country in the world. And I can't guarantee that the president-elect won't pursue some of the positions that he's taken. But what I can guarantee is, is that reality will force him to adjust how he approaches many of these issues. That's just the way this office works. And I've said before, if these issues were easy if ensuring prosperity, jobs, security. Good foreign relations with other countries if all that was simple, then it would have been done by every previous president. And I'm a pretty good presidential historian, I've looked at my 43 predecessors. And it seems like for all of them even the best ones that you end up confronting realities that you didn't. Anticipate. I think the same will happen here. And that's a good thing. That's an important thing. With respect to President Putin, I didn't have a meeting. We talked briefly while we were in between sessions. And the conversation that I had with him was consistent with the conversations I've had with him over the previous several months. indicating to him that we are still deeply concerned. About the bloodshed and chaos that's being sown by constant bombing attacks by Assad and the
Russian military against populations in Aleppo, and the need for us to arrive first at some. sort of humanitarian ceasefire and begin moving towards a political transition of some sort. And I talked to him about Ukraine and the need for us to get Minsk done. I urged him to instruct his negotiators to work with ourselves, with Francis. With Germany, with Ukraine to see if we can get that done before my term is up. As usual, it was a candid and courteous meeting. But very clear about the strong differences that we have on policy. The issue of the elections did not come up because that's behind us and I was focused in. This brief discussion on moving forward. I had already made very clear to him our concerns around cyber attacks. generally, as well as specific concerns we had surrounding the DNC hack. I don't think this will be the norm, but as I've said before, the concern I have has less to do with. Any particular misinformation or propaganda that's being put out by any particular party. And a greater concern about the general misinformation from all kinds of sources domestic, foreign. on social media that make it very difficult for voters to figure out what's true and what's not. And let me put it this way. I think if we have a strong, accurate, and responsible press, and we have a strong civic culture and an engaged citizenry, then various attempts to meddle in our elections won't mean much. If, generally, we've got elections that aren't focused on issues and are full of fake news. and false information and distractions, then the issue is not going to be what's happening from the outside.
the issue is going to be what are we doing for ourselves from the inside. The good news is that's something that we have control over. Gardner Harris Question, MR President, thanks so much for holding this press conference. If you had had hotels, real estate, and other businesses distributed around the world prior to becoming president. Would you have thought it appropriate to sell them off and put the cash proceeds in a blind trust? Or is it okay for the President of the United States to be personally vulnerable to the policy? Decisions of the foreign leaders he meets and in the foreign policy decisions he makes as president? And also, just briefly, what's your complaint about how the NSA and Cyber Command have done their job? And are you considering firing Admiral Mike Rogers? President Obama, that was a rhetorical question, that first one. Rather than comment on hypotheticals, let me say specifically what I did. Obviously, my assets were significantly smaller than some other presidents or president-elects. But we made a decision to liquidate assets that might raise questions about how it would influence policy. I basically had our accountant put all our money in treasury bills the yields, by the way. Have not been massive over the course of the last eight years just because it simplified my life. I did not have to worry about the complexities of weather. A decision that I made might even inadvertently benefit me. And that's consistent with the broader approach that we've taken throughout my administration.
which is to not just meet the letter of the law, but to go well beyond the letter to the spirit of the law not just for me. but for the people in the White House and in our leadership positions. We have established a whole set of rules, norms, playbooks that just keep us far away from the line. Early on in the administration, there would be questions about could a staff person go to this conference. Or what should they do about this gift that was provided? And I think it was maybe our first general counsel who was responsible for setting up our guidelines. And rules inside the White House that said, if it sounds like it would be fun, then you can't do it. That's a general test. If it sounds like something you would enjoy or appreciate, no go. And as a consequence, and I'll knock on some wood here, because we got two months left, I am extremely proud. of the fact that over eight years we have not had the kinds of scandals that have plagued other administrations. And when I met with the president-elect, I suggested to him that having a strong White House counsel that could provide clear guideposts and rules would. Benefit him and benefit his team because it would eliminate a lot of ambiguity. And I think it will be up to him to make determinations about how he wants to approach it. I know what worked for us, and I think it served the American people well. And because I had made a promise to the American people that I would not fall into some of the familiar habits of Washington. That I wanted a new kind of politics, this was one indicator. And at the end of eight years, I think I can say to the American people I delivered on that commitment. With respect to cyber, the NSA.
Admiral Rogers is a terrific patriot and has served this country well in a number of positions. I generally don't comment on personnel matters here. I can say generally that we've spent a lot of time over the last several years looking at how we can organize our cyber efforts to keep pace with how rapidly the environment is changing. Increasingly, our critical infrastructure, government data, financial systems are vulnerable to attack. And both state and non-state actors are getting better and better at it, and it is becoming more and more rapid. And it is inevitable that we're doing to have to modernize and update not just the tools we use to defend those assets and the American people, but also how we organize it. And it is true that we are exploring a range of options in terms of how we organize the mission that currently exists. Rich Edson Question. President Obama, well, no, I'm not worried about being the last Democratic president. I think not even for a while. And I say that, not being cued. The Democratic nominee won the popular vote. And obviously this was an extremely competitive race and I would expect that future races will be competitive as well. I certainly think it's true that politics in America right now are a little up for grabs. That some of the old alignments within both parties Democrat and Republican are being reshaped. And although the results of this election involved some of the specifics of the candidates and aren't. Going to be duplicated in every subsequent election, Democrats do have to do some thinking about.
How do we make sure that the message we have is received effectively and results in winning elections?